Rachel Cry, and to episode two of season seven. I am currently starting The Book of Cold Cases by Simone St. James to kind of get me in the uh, mood for this season of Caffeine and Crime. Um, I also am looking into getting um, my life solving America's cold cases, is that what it's called? Something like that. It's by, I think, Paul Holes and somebody else, but it's like actual, like, um, nonfiction. So it's like based on like, tr like actual cold cases that this, or these people have worked on. So, um, I'm really intrigued to like pick up that one too, but my book load and my to be read stack is so high when I'm not making the time to sit down and make notes for this season or <laughs> um, filming for my beauty content or hanging out with my kiddos. I have my nose in a book. Um, it's been a serious hobby lately. My book collection is growing like no other and um, I even went as far as today going to get a library card again because we actually haven't went to our local library and like a year or so. Um, so yeah, I went and renewed my library card and got some books and that is my interesting life if you wanted to know. <laughs> I hope that you guys are all doing well though, um, but that that's also like my little intro tidbit to also say if you have good book recommendations, let me know. I am always open. Um, I love thrillers, true crime, um, adventure, like you know, suspense, horror. I love all those. Um, I sprinkle in a little bit of other stuff here and there, but those are like my go-to. I also love graphic novels, manga. Um, so yeah, any recommendation, book recommendations, send them my way. Like always, check out today's blog. It will be down below in the description area. Um, you can check it out there for visuals. If you're just listening to the podcast, uh, pictures of today's case will be there. You can also find me on Instagram at Caffeine Crime Podcast to discuss today's case. Comment on today's post and we can talk about it. Or if you feel a little bit safer, you can DM me and we'll have just more of a authentic one-on-one -on -one talk um, that is more anonymous for you. And I also just wanted to throw it out there again for my podcast listeners that this season is on YouTube. So if you do prefer more visuals, jump over to YouTube. We would love to have you. This week, we are talking about the Hall Mills murders. Now, we're going a little ways back for this one. But first, we're going to introduce some of the key people in this case. Edward Hall was born in 1881. Yes. Yes. 1881, not 1981, in Brooklyn, New York. He became a minister in New York and Jersey. Then in 1909 at St. John's in New Brunswick. So we're not going to have too much history on their childhoods, unfortunately, um, because this goes back into 1881 when he was born that type of their lives we're not going to really know too much about, but there still is quite a bit of a story going along with this. This is a very, like a movie case. It just seems like the whole time I was researching this, I literally felt like I was either watching a movie or like reading a fiction book. It just is just a crazy case. He met Frances Stevens at St. John's who would become his wife. She was born in 1874, so she was a little bit older than he was, and she was the heir of the Johnson & Johnson Company. Like, back then, I think it had a different, like, trademark, but it's what is now known as Johnson & Johnson Company. Her and her two brothers, Will and Henry, which will come into play quite a bit in this story, so keep those names in mind, um, were all worth, at that time, two million dollars each. So at that time, that's how much they were worth. Can you imagine? She was said to be a homely woman. Whatever you make of that. Um, okay. I don't see people leaving descriptions about how these men were, if they were homely or not, but okay. Um, but this was said because 
a woman with such wealth didn't have what they thought to be the standards and beauty at the time. I guess some people just couldn't stand the fact that they had money. But a reporter once said, she's not fully unattractive, but not fully good looking. Wow. Frances and Edward married in 1911. He was 30 and she was 37. Everyone assumed that he was in the marriage for the money. They said because of her looks, her age, which seven years is not that, that big of a gap, Jesus, people. Um, and the fact that after the marriage, he moved in with her and her brother, Willie, and their family home. So the home that had been passed down to them from their parents that was pretty nice, especially at that time. All right, now we're going to jump to the Mills. James Mills. He was born on January 27th, 1878. He was a shoemaker before coming a janitor at the St. John's Church. The same church that our minister, Edward Hall, is at. Now, Eleanor Mills, I'm not really sure what her name was before Mills, um, but she was a soprano in the church choir and she married James at the age of 15. She was a member of the ladies group at the church as well as the choir, so she was always very involved with everything. Any type of functions they had going on, she was always there helping out. When she had free time, she loved reading romance novels. And in 1906, she gave birth to their daughter, Charlotte Mills, and then a son, Daniel Mills, in 1910. They lived in a pretty rundown home. They didn't have nearly as much as the Halls did. So James Mills made $35 a week, so money was pretty tight for them. Eleanor and Edward started having an affair. So we're talking about Edward Hall, the minister, and Eleanor Mills, the soprano in the choir. Yes, the minister. Is it a shocker? Not really. I don't know when this started, but it said that they hung out with each other quite a bit. And a lot of this took place around 1919. They spent almost every day together. Both James and Francis, so the spouses, claimed that they had no idea about this affair. But apparently, the entire church, the entire town, and everyone in the surrounding area would talk about it. On September 14th, 1922, Francis and James both would say their spouse never came home that night. Usually, they came home five, six in the afternoon when things were wrapping up at the church. It was now 2 a.m. and neither of them had come home. Frances and her brother, Willie, decided to go looking for Edward, so they went to the church. They looked all around the area and could not find him. There was no trace of him, so they went back home. Two days later, another couple were out for a stroll together. They were going down what was known as Lover's Lane. This was a popular walking area for many couples that would go and at the time they probably called it necking. But many couples would come here together. It was a very normal thing. It was Somerset, New Jersey, right outside of New Brunswick. And as a couple were walking and chatting, they came across two bodies in a field. They see under an apple tree, a man laying wearing a dark gray suit, a white shirt with a stiff white collar and a tie. There was a Panama hat placed over his face and by his side was the lady. She had her legs crossed and her head resting on his outstretched arm. Her left hand was resting on his knee. She was wearing a polka dotted dress and a brown woolen scarf. Looking closely, the woman had been shot three times, both dead but positioned romantically. The couple then ran to the nearest home to use the phone to call in about the bodies. And two police officers came within minutes. They moved the scarf and realized that the lady's throat was completely ripped out. They must have also known them because they were able to ID the bodies very, very quickly as Edward Hall and Eleanor Mills. Around the bodies was torn up paper and some of it was love letters that they had written each other. 
Also, we have to note here that Edward's business card was also found on the ground a little bit lower than his shoes, so down by his feet. And by the wounds, they guessed that they had been dead for about 24 hours. So now the rumors of the choir singer and the minister were true, and it was spreading like wildfire. The police picked up all of these little pieces of papers and then started putting them together to see what they could make out of them because they really didn't have like a whole lot whenever you just find two bodies laying in a field. One of the letters was pieced back together by police to form a letter to Edward from Eleanor. And I quote, Sweetheart, my true heart. I know there are girls with more shapely bodies, but I am not caring of what they have. I have the greatest part of all blessings, a noble's man, deep, true, eternal love. I want to look up at your dear face for hours as you touch my body close. In the letters, they come across one from Edward to Eleanor, and I quote, Darling, wonder heart, I just want... I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to try to do this seriously. It's just so weird reading a letter from early 1922. Um, especially knowing that this was written to a woman from a minister that he was not even married to, and he had a, a wife. Okay. We're going to start this again. And I quote, Darling, wonder heart, I just want to crush you for two hours. I want to see you Friday night and by our road. We can let out that universe of joy and happiness we call ours. End quote. Well, these obviously confirmed the affair for sure, if finding them together didn't already. Autopsy showed that Edward was shot point blank range with a 36 caliber. A bullet had entered his temple and out the backside. Eleanor was shot three times in the head. One was two inches above the nose on the forehead. One went through the left cheek and the last through the right temple. Whoever did this also literally ripped her throat. So at that point, they have to know that this was a personal attack. She was a singer in the choir. Of course, they would go for her throat like that. Her jugular vein, windpipe, and neck muscles were severed. Her backbone could be easily seen. Ugh. And since it seemed so personal, of course the cops automatically were like, we need to look into the spouses. That's usually, I feel like, what you look into anyways, especially when it involves an affair. The media got a hold of it, and people went absolutely crazy. Where the bodies were found became a place to be. Not just people exploring the area, but the fact that so many people would go to the scene that carnivals and concession stands and all kinds of things were starting to pop up in that spot because they knew tons of people would be there. Vendors were setting up like crazy. You could get balloons, food, and there would be thousands of cars there every day. You think true crime people are like obsessed and crazy these days. Can you imagine that? Like a crime scene and people are just setting up a carnival and concession stands. Hundreds of people wanted to see if they could find blood or evidence. Weeks after the bodies were found, bits and pieces of the apple tree kept going until every branch was gone and it was bare with not even a single amount of bark left. Everyone wanted a souvenir of the crime scene. So they literally broke off every branch, chipped off every single piece of bark until this tree was complete bare because it was a souvenir from this crime. They would take a piece of the tree and one person took samples of the surrounding dirt and put it in bags and they would go and sell the bags and say this was dirt from the crime scene and they would sell them for 25 cents a bag which I'm sure at that time was just like probably selling dirt for like 25 bucks. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's even said that people were scamming people too and of course who wouldn't by just going to their backyard and shoveling some dirt into some bags and being like dirt from the crime scene. People are sick. With all the people any evidence in the going ongoing case uh, was destroyed and that makes me so mad like why wouldn't the cops just like block this off like tape it off. I mean I know this is 1922 but come on common sense. 
But with all of this and the fact that the lack of technology back at that time, uh, the case went cold very fast. Police didn't question James Mill, saying that he was, quote, dull and would never commit murders like this. I think it was also the fact that he had a strong alibi, though, because the neighbors said that they had heard him, like, chopping wood or something at the house, but still, question it. Frances, the woman on the other side of this whole ordeal, was questioned, and she said she was home with her maid, and the maid confirmed that. Or was she forced to say that? We'll never know, but the police... They had no leads. The case was cold. Weeks later, a 50-year-old woman, Jane Gibson, who was a hog farmer right next to Lover's Lane, she would monitor her farm area, so she would kind of ride around on her horse a lot, and Lover's Lane was not far from her property, so she would kind of go through there riding on her horse. The night of these killings, she reported that she heard gunshots, and a woman yelled the name, Henry. Now remember, is that name a little familiar? Frances had two brothers, Henry and Willie. She then said she had seen two women and two men at the crime scene before the gunshots. But Mrs. Gibson, after giving her statement, was harassed by the media. She even got the nickname the Pig Woman. It was in daily papers. They never called her by name. They would just call her the Pig Woman. The media called her a liar, and they said she was just trying to get attention. They just showed a very awful light on her in the media, so everybody kind of ran with that. But Frances had two brothers, Willie and Henry. The police go back, and they question all of them. They even get taken in and had to face a grand jury on the charges with just having that little bit of information. But they were let go because there was no ev evidence besides that it was a she said, he said situation with this witness statement. The case was dropped and cold once again. And for years it went cold. But then in 1926, four years later, a man named Arthur was separating from his wife because she withheld secrets he wasn't able to keep any longer. And who was his wife, you may be wondering? The maid, Frances's maid, you know, the one who had the alibi for the murder. She had a lot of secrets, though. She knew that the affair was becoming serious. She knew that Edward planned to elope with Eleanor very soon before their murders. She also knew that Willie, one of Frances's brother, owned a 36 caliber pistol. They also paid this ex maid 5K, which at the time, $5,000 was a lot back then, to keep her mouth shut. After the media gets a hold of this, the ex-maid comes forward and denies all of it, saying that her husband made it all up, he wants attention, and it's all fake. The press had already pushed out Arthur's statement, though, so things weren't looking too hot for her with her deal with Francis, if allegedly that was an actual deal. It went as far to have the police reopen the case after all the, the years and look into Francis once again. And on July 28th, 1926, Francis Hall was taken into custody. After several hearings with witnesses that came forward saying they had heard something, the jury indicted her brothers, Henry, Willie, and their cousin Henry, because apparently they had a cousin Henry too. So it was kind of like a, okay... Mrs. Gibson heard the name Henry, but was it her brother or her cousin? They said it has to be one of them, and the trial was quite the show. The streets were filled with people, vendors again, the whole shebang. The business card of Edward Hall from the crime scene was brought in from evidence, and it had Willie's fingerprints all over it. The same card had been handled by police and many other people, so this couldn't be concrete enough evidence. It apparently was passed around, like, after the bodies were found, like, everybody was like, oh, look what I found, look what I found, you know, like, just passing it around. Mrs. Gibson was brought in from a hospital to be witness to this jury. Bless her heart. She was the quote-unquote pig woman who raised hogs. 
But by this time, her health was pretty bad. They had to bring her in on a stretcher and then place her on a metal hospital bed. You can see the pictures in today's blog if you're just listening. But that's how she was brought in to be a witness for this jury. And the, the names that she was called from all the media and everything else, when literally she did nothing, she did nothing wrong. Like she was just riding around her property. She thought it was probably a good idea to come forward with what she had heard and was just called the pig woman. During her statement, her own mother in the first row would yell, she's a liar, over and over. Since the media already called her this and tried to discredit her, this was an really easy for the prosecutors to uh, discredit her in court, claiming that she had an affair which ended her own marriage. Um, they brought up her past lovers, said she wasn't honest and couldn't be trusted. Of course, they tried to make you look like a dog on the stand. Well, in her case, in a literal hospital bed. Frances took the stand and said that her husband was absolutely devoted to her. And after countless, and I mean many, many, many witnesses, tons of people at this point wanted to come forward. There was like over, I think, 70 witnesses saying that they had heard something or they had seen something. At this point, what could you, like, take as seriously and what could you not, though? Everybody wanted to be involved, so it, not a lot could be trusted. The jury found Frances her brothers and cousin, all not guilty. And the case is still unsolved. It's still a cold case. I feel like it definitely is another one of those that we're just like, it's a cold case, but we know who did it. We know, we're smarter. After the trial, Francis and her brothers sued the Daily Mirror and Evening Journal for slander, like they needed more money, um, but they were mad about what was being said about them with this trial, um, but they both were able to settle it outside of court. Crazy case. A lot shorter than last week's, but I just found it very, very interesting. I mean, it literally is just like watching like an older movie, like the minister and the choir girl falling in love. Oh no, it's unfair. I mean, I guess not older movie. I feel like it'd be like a newer movie that was like based on older times just so they can make it like a little more risque, but like still kind of stick to like older times. Like they're innocent. They've just fallen in love. They can't help it. Ugh. How sad for them though. But that is the tragic, sad story of the Hall Mills murders. Let me know what you guys think. Um, again, check out the blog link down below and also jump over to my Instagram, show it some love. Let me know what you think. I hope you guys are enjoying the season so far. I will be back next week with episode three. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Would love to know what you think of this whole case. Um, but yeah, thank you for tuning in and I will see you next week.